welcome NutritionRadio.org listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry, the university nutrition professor of over 20 years and podcast host of long-running shows like Iron Radio. Come on in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another issue of Iron Radio. <laughs> I mean, episode of Iron Radio. Old habits die hard. Anyway, today we have Sean and Gabby Fairbanks again, experienced lifters. We're going to talk about four topics here. In the beginning, we have wearable technology and their perspective and a little bit of review on that. Then we're going to talk about the science, if you will, of NSAIDs, all right? uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so aspirin versus ibuprofen in particular. Then we have a weight gain tip. We're talking about the struggles of lean weight gain with Sean and Gabby. And finally, a recipe that kind of goes with that topic of weight gain, and it's a no-bake cookie. Now, having said that, who am I? If you're just tuning in, I've been an exercise physiology and nutrition professor for about 20 years, um, former competitive bodybuilder, that kind of thing. I can go the food industry. How about you guys? Uh, Sean, you want to go? Yeah, uh, I'm Sean Fairbanks. I've uh, been a professional tattoo artist for 28 years. Um, powerlifter the last couple years, um, fitness enthusiast. I hand make some uh, workout journals and uh, make a good beard product. And I am Gabby Fairbanks. I am from Guatemala. I am a dancer, now a powerlifter, a mom of two, a wife. Yeah, an overall person, I guess. Looking for, <laughs> for help. That's a, that's a big jump from dancer to powerlifter, isn't it? Or Or was it? Yes, oh, go ahead. Uh, because if you are small, you fit into the clothes better and you look better. Um, but yeah, so I've always did, done some salsa dancing, bachata and all of that. And then in Montana, it was really weird to, I mean, hard to find something like that. So I just went to Zumba classes and stuff. So I do performances every single year and we work on that. But then powerlifting, um, um, it's pretty hard to make mix the two because with powerlifting you you don't you're not that flexible some moves that are i struggle a little bit but since i'm always like dancing twice or three times a week and then powerlifting every day like i think it's a good balance okay yeah because i think that's going to affect when we talk about weight gain tips no because yeah weight gain it's more challenging in some ways for women uh i don't want to sound sexist but you know there are stereotypes and some people that uh just, it's hard to overcome some of that. Like, I want to gain weight, and that's just going against the grain. So we're going to talk about that. Let's yeah. start with our first section then, uh, which is technology wearables. Market news, food, and fitness trends. I know you guys have had some experience with different things. What have you tried? Like, let's get a little review of this kind of stuff, and how do you use it? We use that aura ring quite a bit, and that will um, – log your sleep, your oxygen level, and all those things. But then we also have the Apple Watch. So uh, it's kind of nice because sometimes you can encourage people. And like whenever you know that when you're sharing information and somebody finishes a workout, you have the option to reply to their workout and say, oh, good job. And oh, keep going. And oh, I see you. You did so good. And um, sometimes people need a, an extra oomph on that. Um, I have family all over the world. I have a brother in Vietnam with my sister-in-law, so we share the data. So that way, when they're competing in Vietnam, like at two in the morning, uh, I wake up and then I see that they did a workout. So I always compete with them. I'm like, oh, I see you. Wait, I'm just waking up. I'm catching up. So we keep connected in that way. We don't talk much uh, or we don't talk every week, but we're always every day uh, encouraging for working out. I have an identical twin that lives in California. Same with her. Um, Sean has a brother in Oregon and with him, it's more of a always we're competing like, Oh, you beat me this week. Okay, fine. I'll beat you this week. And then we're logging, walking, we're logging, going up the stairs. We're logging, uh, dancing, we're logging everything to beat each other. So it's, we build this community with our family all over the world that it keeps you motivated and it's fun. So it's like, Ooh, I'm going to go walk for a mile just because I want to beat Jason today. So it's 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 fun. I I log strength training. I I don't log the going up the stairs and the walking across the yard and the. Fine. <laughs> yeah, you need to limit that. You're trying to gain weight. Yeah, yeah. I try and move around uh, less. I have always wondered when the Apple Watch is going to come out with a way to measure blood sugar. Uh, there used to be something called the Glucowatch, 
and it had little tiny micro needles on the back side of it, and that sounds weird and scratchy, and but you didn't really notice it. Uh, that product doesn't exist anymore. God, that was about twenty years ago now. But I've always thought if they can find a way, a clever engineering way to measure the glucose, maybe in your interstitial fluid, just beneath your skin, you know, and somehow extrapolate that to blood sugar. I know that they do have uh, different watches now that will look at your blood sugar. Some of them are like the Freestyle Libre. There's a couple of different ones now. They're not always for prescription. At first, just for diabetics. But you wear a little like a, just a little nickel-sized sensor on your triceps, and it'll give you your blood sugar readings all the time. And I guess a lot of endurance athletes are doing that and stuff. But what's most valuable to you out of wearing these wearables? I mean, obviously, you use them. Is it the sleep? Is it like heart rate variability uh, for overtraining purposes or whatever? Like, what's good about the different devices? Well, so to be completely honest with the uh, with the heart rate variability, I mean, I, you know, I listen to you guys talk about it a lot. Mike Nelson talks about it a lot. And I'm actually uh, not quite to the section of his course about uh, what to do with that information. But no, we we track. I track my sleep. I'm most interested to see how much I slept. You, know, you start wearing something that's tracking your sleep and you realize that even though you're in bed for nine hours, you only slept for seven and, and it explains quite a bit on how you feel the next day with the, with the watch, you know, tracking the exercises, I, I like to be able to record my heart rate throughout the session, you know, how long it took when we go on walks, when we go on runs, you know, well, I don't run, but when we go on walks, uh, hikes and things like that. It's nice to see, you know, how far you went, what your heart rate did when you were doing all that, um, and that sort of thing. We've got an older Apple Watch. I mean, we don't have the newest version by any means. My brother does, but it track, you know, just being able to track those things. I know I've got some friends that wear Fitbits for tracking their steps and their heart rate and stuff. Um, but mm-hmm. for me, yeah, I, I like I like being able to just see what my heart rate did throughout the session, how quickly it kind of came back down after after training and then keeping a running log on how long I was working out and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the little bit of kind of competition or, you know, uh, notifications of the other friends and family that we have that wear them, you know, letting us know that they've finished a workout, they've done something. Yeah. Yeah. For me, that comes, I mean, it's good to have the information, but, but for me, that's second. Um, I don't get to see my family ever. So for me, I keep, I, I know what they're doing. I keep, ta- not keep tabs on them, but I know that they're working out. I know that we're together. We don't have time to sit down just because of the time change. And they're all over, like at the other side of the world, we don't have time to sit down and have a conversation. But yeah. I know that my brother will like, hey, good, good job, Goober. You worked out today. Yay. And I'm like, oh, you didn't work out today. So at least we're connected in that way. So mm-hmm. I do it just to keep, to keep close with my family because otherwise I, I, I wouldn't even know what they're doing. But with that, um, we can set a little like, oh, he, you're, I ran today and then my heart level, because there's an option that you can send how your heart level is going, like the beating. So, okay. so you can just send that. And I, I just feel them closer when they're so far away. Cause otherwise I wouldn't. So th- th- I, I do that for that part. Mostly. The yeah. That's kind of fun. Stuff is, is second. I just do it to stay together, I guess. It's just different from email. Hey, how are you doing in general? Like it's something that kind of, focus on that you can do with them in a virtual way uh the social side is that's interesting to me yeah i've I've always been so solo in the way i do the training and stuff but but i can see that like logging food or missing workouts or whatever you're doing just getting a little bit of like social support that's that's got to be a big deal yeah sean sean like he said he does it for the for the not the logic but the intelligent part of it and like oh i'm tracking my sleep oh let's look at this and i do it like my brother did not work out today okay right (laughs) competitive right yeah 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 you know i saw uh i think it might have been on the science friday podcast a couple of years ago one of the things as we head into an age of ai especially is the privacy issue i think they're gonna have to be real careful with these wearable technologies because it's one thing to let your family know this stuff. It's another thing looking forward to for insurance companies to say, oh, you're not working out. We're going to raise your rates. You know what I'm saying? For like oh, health right. insurance. And so they're going to have to make sure that they keep this stuff uh, private because the more wearables you have, to me, it's like having an Alexa in your house. Is that the government listening to you? <laughs> you know, I don't want right. to sound like a 
conspiracy theorist, but you get all these ads, you know, sometimes just having my phone on me. I'll see an ad on YouTube. This is something my wife and I were talking about. I'm like, oh, that's creepy. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really want them saying, oh, Lana, you know, your heart rate variability is high, you're stressed, or you're, you got higher blood pressure, or blood sugar. I mean, looking down the road, if they start doing that stuff better. And then we're going to raise your rates, you know, because, I mean, there's a, there's a local hospital chain here. Like, they'll fire you if you have nicotine in your blood, you know, or right. cotiny, you know, the metabolite of it and that kind of – and it makes you wonder, like, how much control – like, you guys are – you have your own business, so you're immune to some of that, I imagine. But, yeah, that's, that's looking down the road. It's like it's great to have all this information. Let's just make sure it's just ours, you know, that right. it, stays, it stays with us. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. It was just kind of a disturbing episode. I think it was one of those almost scary things they were doing it just to get a rise out of people. Okay. So, yeah, wearables are, are a thing. The Aura Ring, God, about 10 years ago, Mike Nelson and I, we were playing around with these headbands that you would wear, and it would show you how much, like, deep sleep you have and REM sleep and all that kind of stuff. And I did that for a while. I'm guessing that the watches, they just do it ba- based on how many movements you have, like when you're still versus when you're moving. is like an accelerometer. Is that, is that how that works? I, I would imagine. I know the newer watches have, track it a little bit better. Like I said, we've got older. We got like third or fourth generation watches, so they're they're kind of older. But um, yeah, when you're sleeping, it I would assume that to some degree it's just watching your heart rate when your heart rate kind of stabilizes, and then you know the, okay. the movement, yeah, and that sort of thing. I know mm-hmm. my Aura Ring seems to also kind of track some of my sleep through how much I'm moving around because. Uh, I got a sleep test to figure out whether or not I was going to get a CPAP, which I did. And Mm -hmm. when I put the, you know, the test on, I had the worst night's sleep of my life. I mean, I'm strapped to all this stuff. I'm laying on my back, which I always slept on my stomach. So I'm laying on my back. I can't roll over. I'm attached to all this stuff. I'm laying there pretty much awake all night long. And the next morning, my aura ring says, wow, you had a great sleep. (laughs) It's like, well, I didn't Uh. move, but. (laughs) Right. (laughs) For a reason. Yeah. (laughs) So right. I think some of that's just going to kind of track how much you're moving around and fidgeting around. And then, yeah, also kind of watching your heart rate when it kind of settles down and stabilizes. Yeah, it is sort of remarkable how much information they can get just out of stuff like, you know, beat to beat variability in heart rate or how much you move when you sleep. And we're always talking about how sleep is probably, I guess, arguably the most important thing you can think about for health and until the wearables, people didn't really monitor it well. You know, mm-hmm. I I was guilty of that myself. Like like you were saying, the, the next day I'm like, I'm so tired. What? Why am I? You know, is it something I ate? Am I not? What am I not doing? Well, maybe I slept like hell last night, and it's kind of hard to know if you don't have any data. I yeah. Mean, ballpark it. But, okay. Yeah. No, that's good stuff. It's it's the kind of thing I think we need to look forward to. You know, all the different things that are going to come down the pike and and. Uh, what can be measured all right next up we've got the NSAIDs NSAIDs breaking nutrition science non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs Uh, you guys brought this up Um, maybe what's the story behind this um, so that's with me. So, uh, again, I am from Guatemala and I, uh, I moved to the States when I was like 25, 26, but growing up in Guatemala, you never took ibuprofen. You never took Tylenol. You never took any of that, even though you can go to the pharmacy and you can buy whatever you want. You can buy any type of antibiotic. You can buy penicillin. You can buy any of that. Like you don't need a doctor's note for anything. unlike here in the States. Wow. Um, but anyways, if you had a headache, you would get baby aspirin. But of course, you would treat everything with like, if you have a stomach ache, you, your mom will make you some tea. If you were feeling sick, your mom will make you chicken soup. If you had a headache, then you have to like lay down for a minute with an ice pack. And then if it didn't go away, then you will take the aspirin. But we only took ibuprofen if you like broke a bone or something and, and then you were obviously to the eye swollen then you would take ibuprofen. And then if you had the flu or a cold, then you would take Tylenol. So I grew up like that. Um, and I, when I first moved here, I would always be looking for aspirin and baby aspirin. That's what I did with the kids until like right now, I, I think ibuprofen is my best friend. <laughs> so when I have to do a heavy mm-hmm. workout or um, I, feel, uh, I feel the workout from the, from the day before I take ibuprofen, but I still go to aspirin. 
um, uh, most of the time. And then I was wondering like what the difference is, but, uh, I, yeah, I grew up just taking aspirin and, and doing natural stuff, but ibuprofen and Tylenol was never, uh, the go-to. Yeah. No, right. I think part of the reason we were, um, curious what the, the research says about those two is, you know, recently, you know, I had an elbow injury and, you know, I was taking, uh, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, you know, once a day, um, went and saw the doctor and she was saying, you know, to take 800 milligrams three to four times a day. But, you know, she said, you know, a lot of people won't comply with that. So we'll just give you a prednisone as an anti-inflammatory, uh, mm. you know, a run of prednisone. And it's like, okay, I can't just take the ibuprofen. I mean, and in my mind, I always thought that, you know, taking you know, 800 milligrams, four times a day. That's just a lot on your kidneys. I had a friend of mine whose dad took ibuprofen constantly and ended up with so many kidney stones and, you know, basically said that that was part of the reason. So, you know, I always thought taking that much ibuprofen probably wasn't the best thing to do. Um, Gabby had a concussion recently, went to the doctor and they were recommending, you know, ibuprofen on top of Tylenol, on top of Excedrin, on top of, you know, all this other stuff and wanted her to do that every day for the next six months and you know we just kind of got to thinking you know there's got to be you know some damage that occurs at some point when you're taking that much ibuprofen so yeah i got scared from um i took a picture of what the doctor told me to or how much medication to take with the ibuprofen and i even asked her that that is way too much like when is that too much that my kidneys and my liver will start like feeling the afterwards and then she said oh no you're just like doing a little bit i'm like i am doing a lot if i if i'm gonna uh take ibuprofen because i i am swollen or something or or i did a heavy workout like i only take like three pills or four pills i don't know how many milligrams that is 800 milligrams but that is way too much and then she just looked at me like i didn't know what i was talking about and i just said i am just concerned when my kidneys and my liver are going to suffer with all of this and then she said, just let's just start this for the next three or four months and then just come back and then and then we'll revalue, revalue that. And I'm like, OK, so I didn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, yeah, I just come home and I will take a little bit of ibuprofen or an aspirin. And then if I have a headache, because I do wake up with a headache and I'll just start. I'll just keep forgetting stuff. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Pros and cons. I mean, obviously, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, they can be really good for joint pain and and stuff like that. To your point about the kidneys, I'm just looking at kidney.org here. Can analgesics hurt kidneys? This is just a real high-level view, but it kind of echoes what you guys are saying. Heavy or long-term use of some of these medicines, such as ibuprofen, naproxen, and high-dose aspirin, can cause chronic kidney disease known as chronic interstitial nephritis. It says the warning labels on the -the over-the-counter analgesics tell you not to use these medicines for more than 10 days for pain or three days for fever. Now, there's some reasons for that. The important thing is to check with the doctor, I think, you know, check with the physician about what's appropriate and what's not. But for years, I used ibuprofen uh, as a lifter. I'm not a big person, right? So I would lift with these guys who were twice my size and my joints were always shot and that kind of stuff. But a couple of things here about aspirin versus ibuprofen. The title of this one, this is by Lilja, L-I-L-J-A, and colleagues. Limited effect of over-the-counter doses of ibuprofen on mechanisms related to muscle hypertrophy during resistance training in young adults. So it says, here we show that mTOR signaling, fiber size, ribosome biogenesis, satellite cell content, myonuclear accretion, uh, and angiogenesis were not different between the groups. They looked at aspirin versus ibuprofen, eight weeks uh, of training. So the, all the things that I just mentioned, the mTOR, that's just you know biochemical pathway for the protein synthesis response muscle building, the myonuclear accretion, all these things are just markers of muscle accretion. Um, it says, interestingly, because these guys had done an earlier paper that suggested that aspirin or ibuprofen might interfere with muscle hypertrophy, and, you know, if you're using that as a lifter, you don't want to block muscle growth. But uh, essentially, it says taken together, it appears that these established hypertrophy regulators, all these things that I just mentioned that they measured, do not explain the previously reported deleterious effects of high-dose ibuprofen 
on muscle hypertrophy in young adults. And again, because they had earlier showed that ibuprofen might reduce muscle hypertrophy over this like eight week training period. So that's that's weird stuff. Um, I was at a conference years ago, and a young lady was giving a talk, and she was using ibuprofen, and she's saying she got people real sore. And they had, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness and all that. And she's like, oh, look, there's less white blood cells infiltrating this damaged muscle, this microtrauma muscle, when you take ibuprofen. And it was sort of presented like a good thing. But then a senior researcher in the audience stood up and said, yeah, but then you're interfering with the whole repair process. Those same white blood cells that go in there and cause inflammation, uh, you know, they also help with the muscle remodeling process, like growth factor secretion and all the all that stuff. So I, do you want, is it nice to fool mother nature? Maybe you shouldn't take a ton of ibuprofen, but I think for me, it was always a balance between do my joints hurt bad enough? I can't lift. If I can't lift heavy enough, you know, uh, versus some of these possibly negative effects, it looks like they were almost overturning some of their earlier work. Uh, this is a uh, journal of applied physiology, 2023. So spanking new stuff where they're digging down as to what might be happening with this stuff. So my bias is that it seems a little up in the air as far as is it going to interfere with muscle building. But obviously it's not going to interfere. I mean in my experience, if I can go to the gym and lift heavy. So here's another one. Uh, Effect of aspirin and ibuprofen on GI permeability during exercise. This is by Lambert and colleagues. This is a 2007 paper. International Journal of Sports Med, let's jump to the bottom. These results indicate that with prolonged running, gastroduodenal, so that stomach and the first stage of your intestine, permeability is increased if aspirin or ibuprofen is used prior to such exercise. Further, aspirin promotes greater gastroduodenal permeability and also increases small intestine permeability. So that's interesting stuff. Uh, obviously, you don't want too much permeability in your gut there. You know, you get the risk of sort of a bad guy bacteria infiltrating or affecting the lining of your gut and your the related blood flow and all that. But it's interesting that these things increase that. I mean, everybody knows, I think a lot of people know, that some of these NSAIDs cause some gastric bleeding, and that, that's just kind of a given. It's part of how they work. Now, mm-hmm. Tylenol doesn't, but Tylenol is not anti-inflammatory like aspirin and ibuprofen. So that's the kind of thing, if you're taking it for a fever, yeah, I get it. But otherwise, yeah, I'm not a big fan. I can't tell you how many papers I have read where they look at different nutrients and if they can protect against liver or kidney damage. And what did they use to induce the liver and kidney damage? Tylenol, acetaminophen. And I'm like, oh, that's just disturbing. you know. And I think about all this stuff like, oh, give it to your kids. And I get it. They're trying to avoid these problems that kids might get if they take aspirin in just, just the wrong kind of circumstance. But I'm just not a fan of Tylenol at all because it's not anti-inflammatory. It is a good point, Sean, about when it comes to ibuprofen. You got to take a higher dose typically to get that anti-inflammatory effect, Mm. right? It's not the little 200 milligram analgesic effect. It might be 800 milligrams like you were saying. The other thing that caught my eye just recently was I was reading about how um, everything but aspirin actually has – uh, some deleterious effects on your heart. This is a paper by Risser and colleagues, R-I-S-S-E-R, American Family Physician, 2009. Here's a quote. Although aspirin is cardioprotective, other NSAIDs can worsen congestive heart failure and can increase blood pressure, uh, etc. So in, in many ways, I look at aspirin as sort of, this is my bias, but the natural, it's made from willow bark. You know, it's nature's <laughs> anti-inflammatory as opposed to ibuprofen and some of the others. But I still do turn to ibuprofen when I'm really dealing with inflammation and that kind of stuff. And, I mean, I am not a physician, right? So all yeah. I can do is talk about my personal experience with this stuff. Or, uh, But, yeah, I think my bias would be that after a period of time, I might start looking at what, what can I do with anti-inflammatory, like, uh, nutrients and stuff like that, fish, fish oils and curcumin and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, we do too. We take fish oil um, pretty regularly. Every, you know, every now and again, you get a day or so throughout the week that you forget to take your vitamins. But now we take uh, fish oil, and we were taking curcumin for a while. Oh no, we were taking the the turmeric, the hundred milligram turmeric. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, it's got uh, 
black pepper in it and that. So we were taking the turmeric for, for a good amount of time. Um, those pills just, they get stuck in my throat. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I, I think everybody's just going to have to work with their physician when they're trying to tease these things apart. Like I said, they, they tend to be good meds. I look at aspirin as sort of safer. I mean, yeah. back on on kidney.org here, it says when taken as directed, regular aspirin does not seem to increase risk of kidney disease in people with normal kidney function. However, taking doses that are too large, more than six to eight tablets a day, may temporarily or even possibly permanently reduce kidney function. But again, it seems less problematic than Tylenol for sure, or even ibuprofen. Um, one of the things that I worry about a little bit and before we hit the record button everybody i was just talking about how you stack some of these things and a lot of them they interfere with blood clotting and if you do that too much you, you know you, you don't want to run the risk of some kind of weird micro bleeding or something like that so uh yeah it's the kind of thing i think it's worth bouncing off the doctor or even the the physical therapist or somebody that you're working with but aspirin seems to be the less least toxic among these things and yeah, but yeah, there's only so much you can lean into that. And again, it's all it's going to cause a certain amount of uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. So uh, yeah, everybody just needs to balance out potential side effects with the, the analgesic or the anti-inflammatory. My bias has always been go for the ones that are actually anti-inflammatory instead of like the Tylenol, which really doesn't help too much with that. You know? Yeah. Uh, uh, my 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 thing, like I know uh, I I trust doctors. They went to school for years and years and years to know what they know and they have a lot of patience and stuff but when my one doctor for my concussion when I got rear-ended uh, she told me to take ibuprofen um, 800 milligrams three times a day plus Tylenol um, three times a day plus Excedrin three times a day for up to four to six months yeah that and, sounds like a lot yeah and then she gave me the card and then I said this this seems like way too much when is this going to be damaging my kidney or my liver and all of that and she goes and then she just like looked at me blank and I swear like 10 seconds went by and then she said well it's just little doses and I'm like yeah little do and I responded little doses but like three times a day <laughs> and then yeah. she said well it's only for a, for for un until your headaches and and your concussion feels better and I'm like and how long is going to take well it varies from person to person and I understand that but I I thought that was too much and I came home and I told Sean that um I, I'm not doing it because I feel it's way too much. So I'm just going to, again, just be okay with forgetting stuff. I'll make notes to myself and I'll just take something for a headache in the morning and then I'll just run with it until I get better. Maybe I'm the one that is not doing that okay, but I don't want my kidneys to suffer later. Yeah. You know, we did an episode on Nutrition Radio back earlier this year on NAC, N-acetylcysteine, and how it might help with brain fog and brain inflammation and that kind of stuff. Uh, there were some physicians, they were using that in combination with a, a different medicine. Uh, but it interested me enough because I ended up with, and I don't want to bore everybody, but I ended up with some brain fog from lingering COVID kind of symptoms and stuff. And I thought, I got to try some. And there's some interesting data that they're using different you know, nutrients and supplements as well. Um, yeah, everybody's just, I'm glad that you asked your physician, uh, hey, you know, I'm a little concerned about this or this instead of just blindly following everything. Yes, you respect their education and their experience, but at the same time, yeah, you, you got to make decisions and be part of your own health care, I think, yeah. as far as feedback and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, th that's one. I, I don't know. It's such an individual topic. It, it, like, are you in enough pain joint wise or inflammation wise? And how long do you want to go? How hard and how long do you want to go? You know, and keep talking to your physician. Right. All right. All right, next up, uh, we have a, a changing gears big time here, but we're going to talk about weight gain tips. Weight management tips. So weight gain is something you don't hear about nearly as much in a lot of these um, weight management settings. It's always weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. I get it. Americans are way over fat um, in general. We're not alone in that, but we're really bad at it, probably leading the pack worldwide. But weight gain so adding muscle tissue is what we're really talking about. Yes, you're going to add a little bit of fat when you gain muscle. You know, these people online that say, well, you're just going to gain pure muscle and no fat. That's not how the body works. You're going to gain a little bit of fat almost every time unless you're a rank beginner 
or you're on some kind of anabolic drugs or something. But yeah, you guys had mentioned weight gain tips. What are those? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's two sides of the of the coin, right? So uh, years ago, I was looking for information on how to get big because, of course, you know, as a guy, you know, hitting forty and not having the the size that I always kind of wanted. You know, you start realizing it's more about, you know, how you're going to eat than how you're going to train. For the longest time, I thought, oh, if I just hit it hard in the gym, I'm going to get big. And then you Mm -hmm. realize, no, it's got to be how I'm eating. And you start looking around and there's not a lot of information, at least in the local bookstores and, you know, the the places that you kind of start looking when you don't know where to look. Um, Which, ironically, is how I came across Iron Radio in the first place was because I was just trying to figure out some information on how to get bigger, you know, and how to eat for that, how to train for that. Um, but over the years, I've kind of realized that, you know, as, you know, my wife wants to kind of taper down on her weight and I want to kind of raise it up, it's all kind of the same game that you're playing. You know, it's it's about how do you consume the same volume and have it either pushing you up or down depending on what you're trying to do. So it's always the the little ways to sneak in more or less calories you know getting enough protein obviously because that's what you you kind of have to have just so that your body's functioning the way we're trying to get it to do and then it's like okay so what are you manipulating how are you you know getting more in without having to just gorge more food and as i said last week you know i have to drink so much water when i eat it's it's quite difficult so i succeed the best um obviously in the winter time (laughs) i drink uh you know, right now I, I have a glass of milk in the morning and a glass of milk at night. Well, as we get further into the year and eggnog becomes a thing, then I'll just replace that with eggnog. And <laughs> boy, there's a lot of calories in a glass. Yeah. Of oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? yep. well, of course, you can't do that year round. So, you know, I mean, you bump that up in the wintertime and you get, you know, quite a bit more calories by drinking the same amount of liquid. You know, certainly I could replace the gallon of water that I drink when I eat with a milk or something. But it, at one point, I was thinking juices, but then at the same time, I don't want to just overconsume juices with with all the fructose that's in that and yeah. various other sweeteners that they'll put in added wise. So you know, then it's it's finding that balance of you know what do you do there. But coming up, I have to you know do a taper for for a meet that we're doing in April. So it's like okay, I actually have to switch gears after seven years of trying to figure out how to sneak in more calories and switch to how do I sneak out the calories. Oh. But when you're trying to gain weight and you're trying to do it purposeful and you're trying to do it, you know, the quote unquote right way, you know, you get all these people that, you know, when you say something like, man, I'm just struggling to put on size and everybody's like, man, I could just look at food and I'm going to put on size. Yeah, I'm like, those yeah, people. I can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could sit and eat donuts and, you know, burgers and drink right, beer right. and juice and, you know, I could probably put on some size. But, you know, when you're trying to do it in an intelligent manner and. And keep it relatively, you know, cleaner. Um, it's definitely a struggle. And now, yeah. Kelly, you know, trying to put on some size. She went up a weight category, which you know, of course, you know, she can talk about. But the 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 psychological impact of trying to wrap your brain around as a woman, or as my wife, anyway, maybe not all women, but as my wife, trying to think about getting bigger, and and I'm realizing that as I try and taper down to a lower weight class, it's going to be that you know, struggle of all of a sudden getting under 200 pounds for the first time in 10 years and being kind of well, what that's going to do to my mental state. No, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, with me, it's been hard. So I am uh, five feet and one centimeter. So I am itty bitty. So for me growing up, I uh, a lot of people told me that I have to be about 94 pounds on my frame. So growing up in Guatemala, I, I always w- was under that mentality. All my workouts were towards the pink weights and the purple weights and a lot of cardio. And that's all I did. Um, so every mm-hmm. time that I would step on the scale uh, before I had kids, I was between 100 pounds and 102 pounds. Then <clears throat> I had my daughter. She's 20 now. And then I have my son and he's uh, about to be 13. Before I had my son, I was lingering in that 110, 112. Of course, of course, I was like 28 years old. Um, but now I, my coach, Phil Stevens, told me, I told him that I wanted to have 
um, like bigger quads, bigger shoulders, bigger, bigger booty, and, and also gain um, muscle and strength because of my new passion, which is powerlifting. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do I have to do? And he said, well, you have to gain weight. And I'm like, okay. But he told me that. And I said, okay, let's do it. But I didn't comprehend the struggle that was going to come with that. Um, yeah. That was around November. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do it. It's going to be amazing and great. So then I'm, I started stepping on the scale and then the scale was moving from 125 to 127. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's cool. I'm still in my 20s. That's great. And then it lingered from 128 to 131. I'm like, okay, that, okay, I can, I can still do this. It's fine. It's fine. Still okay. <laughs> yeah, it's still okay. We, we're good. And then it went from 131 to 135. And then something clicked in my brain that, in the mirrors, I just saw me as a little meeple with little arms and little legs. And it it was just horrible. And I I couldn't do it. And then uh, all the tantrums that I threw at Sean, like, I mean, if he had a penny, he'd be a millionaire. It's like, I I can't do it. This is too hard. I I am short. Nothing fits. And my clothes were fitting just right. But nothing fits. It's terrible. I mentally, I was struggling so bad. Um, Phil also had to walk me through saying that first you're going to put on size because like you said, with uh, muscle, uh, you ha- you need the, the cushion <laughs> of fat <laughs> that comes with the muscle. And mm-hmm. then we're going to repurpose all of that. And then you're going to look better. But there were three months that it was it, it was a struggle. And then I feel better. Now I'm lingering that one, 131, 132. And I am way bigger. My old hands don't fit. But like, it, it's it's okay. It's okay. And right now, I find that two weeks ago, my brother-in-law was visiting and we were in the gym and then he looked at me and he said, your quads are huge. And I'm like, oh, thank you. That makes you feel before, good. Yeah. I'm like, thank you. When before it would have been like, oh, it would have like, like killed me for weeks. So I can see the, the gains, but, but it's, it's taking a while. It's funny how you get embedded. Like you're supposed to fit this frame. You have to have the gap as a girl. You have to have a perky butt and, and a tiny waist because otherwise you're not, you, you don't look healthy. Which is mm-hmm. another thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have several friends that I dance with, and there's one friend that you you see her, and she has a six pack. You can see all of her muscles on her shoulders, on her arms, and uh, she's always wearing like like little bra tops and all of that. And everybody always goes to her about what she's doing because she she's tiny, but she doesn't have any like meat to her. So the mm-hmm. reason you look at all, her, all of her muscles is because she has no fat. <laughs> so you only yeah. have the skin surrounded that. And when they look at me, I, again, I don't, I don't look like that. Uh, <laughs> but they don't, they don't come to me to tell me, Gabby, Gabby, what are you doing? Because they don't want to like go out there and, and spend an hour at the gym every day. They don't want to like make sure that they're eating purposefully. They don't, they don't want to like give up their big, coffee with whipped cream and and sprinkles and honey and caramel Mm -hmm. Uh, they go to another girl that what she does is like isogenics or something and that's all she drinks all day uh because that's still the beauty standard not more weight on you or more muscle on you that's not uh, sometimes it seems like it's accepted but not really because all the girls want to want the gap and the abs but they don't want the big legs and the booty in the shoulders or any of that Yeah, I feel like there's a double standard with women a lot of times. It's not – I mean, let's face it. There's a lot of real lean model-looking guys online too. I'm not saying this is never applied to men, but even in the fitness world, uh, I did not envy the female competitors when it came to like uh, fitness and bodybuilding and that kind of stuff. And let's face it, the fitness and bikini competitors of today, they're almost like the bodybuilders of when I was a kid. You know, like the sport has progressed. But you can't be – too soft and or have too much body fat, but you also can't be too lean. The last person I got ready for a contest, I don't really do this typically, but we got her real, real lean. And I mean, women have health issues to think about too. They get too lean, they could lose your period and all this kind of stuff. But the point is, um, the judges told her, oh, you're a little too hard. Well, like, you, you know, how do you hit this floating target as as a woman? Like, you need muscle, but not too much muscle as far as what society's telling you. You need 
a little bit of fat, but not too much fat. Or like I said, when you diet down for competition, even I'm being told you're too hard. Like I can see some veins in your shins or in your abs. Like you're shredded. Uh, women shouldn't be that hard. You need to have a little bit of femininity and softness. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it's just really hard. Like I said, at the time, I, I was just a guy in physique competitions. I just got as big and as lean as humanly possible, and there was no floating target like that. You yeah. know, So even with the athletes, it, it's a challenge. But yeah, overcoming the weight gain stigma, uh, especially, I would think, as a woman, has got to be really hard. Plus, like we were saying early on, you're talking about like I, I could just pile on Cokes and Big Macs and put on a bunch of weight. But that's not yeah. we're, t- we're talking about body composition, right? Not just gross weight. The scale weight, yes, has to change, and that does yeah. freak you out. And it freaks you out in both directions sometimes, right? Like you were saying, uh, Gabby, like oh my God, it's up over one thirty, one thirty five. Or Sean, you're talking about I don't want to be under two hundred. Uh, I hear you. You know, I mean, I'm in my early to mid fifties, and I've been trying to get my head around downsizing. You know, I'm around two hundred pounds now. But I'm smaller, and I'm trying to get used to it. Um, it it's hard. I mean, it's physically hard with getting the pro and the protein, right? Because, and I think a lot of people need, need to think too. Oh, calories are just bad. Well, no, calories from protein are highly unlikely to become body fat. <laughs> talk to a biochemist; you're going to get a very clear explanation. You talk to some people, even some healthcare professionals, they'd say calories from any source is going to lead to weight gain. Yeah, but calories from protein is probably going to be much more supportive of muscle tissue. Four calories in a gram, fine, but those are the building blocks. Then you need all the extra calories knit together those building blocks into new muscle tissue. You know, it's been estimated you need somewhere around 800 surplus calories to build a new pound of muscle. And this is one pound. Nobody's going to see it one pound of muscle on you. You probably wouldn't even see it until you gained five or ten, you know, I would think. Right. So – yeah, so there's the physical challenge of it, and then there's the psychological challenge of it. Um, yeah. That's interesting, you guys, as you get into powerlifting and, the, and as you age and all these things, it's just interesting to hear the story, you know, yeah. about how, how you do it and then how it challenges you mentally. Yeah, and like I said, I, I'm a dancer, and I've been dancing in this community uh, for eight years that we put up a dance every year. And my body has changed. Like my clothes don't fit like they used to two years ago. So every time that I'm trying to put the outfit on, all of the girls tell me, oh, Gabby, what are you doing? I mean, uh, h- how do you get that booty or whatever? And I'm like, well, you know, squatting and deadlifting. And she goes, well, they say, well, I want to do that, but I don't want to get like you. Like, I don't want to look like a little tank like you. And it's like, oh, oh, poo. Um, so they don't want to understand mm-hmm. that. First of all, that's mean. And and second of all, like I, I'm still like before they would say that I was maybe too skinny, but now it's like they don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um so I don't have the support, if that makes sense. So it's kind of a, like mm-hmm. a, a lonely uh struggle that, that I'm doing because they don't know that I'm like smiling and dancing and, and, and just going at it. But like I do feel like, yeah, I don't look like you with your gap in the your cute little skirt, like my, my skirt is rising up because my booty keeps jiggling. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's different for sure. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess you, I have to stick with the goal and like close all the mirrors. <laughs> you know, I wrote, I wrote some articles years ago for T nation. What was called calorie dilution techniques. And it's, a, it's for people who are used to eating a lot and need to eat less. So it was stuff like you can mix instead of having a, a pound of pasta at a time, you mix it half with the fibery vegetables, you know, colored bell peppers or broccoli or whatever it might be. Um, but there are ways to kind of keep the volume of food up. If you're used to eating, and even overeating like you, Sean, you know, there are some things you can do as you decide to dilute what's on that plate with stuff that's mostly just fiber, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then there's also calorie boosting techniques. And like you said, drinking is obviously one of the big tools. I mean, healthy fats because of nine calories per gram and fluids, uh, drinking uh, calories is is a good way to go because then you can arguably be hungry again sooner instead of eating a 16 ounce steak <laughs> that's going to fill you up for a while compared to slamming some protein drinks kind of thing you yeah. know yeah, it's, but, it's 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 funny on the on the note of you know gabby's talking about all of her friends and how they respond to 
to when you're putting on size it's at work i i can't count how many people in the last two years you know come in that haven't haven't come into the shop in a number of years and the first thing out of their mouth seems to be oh man i remember when you were a normal size guy and it's just <laughs> yeah yeah it's just like wow you know i mean like i you know i don't know it's it's, it's that kind of duality of man that feels pretty good that you're saying i'm big and then at the same time it's just like man was i really that small <laughs> right and yeah. When you start thinking about cutting back down, it's like, oh no, I don't want to get back to being tiny. Yeah, um, I mean, we can't forget that this is not just an issue with women. I mean, there's a certain expectation for for guys too. And yeah, once you're bigger, I really think a lot of people who are in powerlifting and bodybuilding, it might even be good to talk to a counselor as they decide to purposely like slim down. You mm-hmm. know, because I'm, I got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm in my fifties. I can try to hold on to this size and I'm going to end up with a big belly and, and a lot of uh, other things. I'm not sure I want to age that way, but I'm also not willing to become a twink. <laughs> I yeah. don't want to wait. And for me, that's like anything under 190. I just, I, first of all, I don't think I can hold my body weight there very far, very long. But yeah. also, I just want to be comfortable. So you just, I guess it's important to just to, you know, um, because it becomes your kind of core identity, your salient identity. I am a bodybuilder, I am a power lifter, or, even in reverse, like, yeah, I'm a dancer and now I'm a power lifter. And, you know, these are, it's kind of hard to deal with. It might be good just to talk about it with somebody, you know, because the, it, it's psychological. It, it's not just a physical challenge. Okay. We have one last thing and that is a recipe. So we're talking about weight gain, of course. Grant product review or recipes. Yeah. So there's a, I, growing up, my, my aunt had this no big recipe that, has been passed around my family and we ate it, you know, growing up all the time. And at one point, you know, you just kind of get trying to think of various recipes uh, like for weight gain that you can get protein in, but you can still get calories in. And, uh, you know, so I was thinking about this no bake recipe that my, my family's passed around, which, you know, no bake cookies, you know, some, a couple cups of sugar, some cocoa, evaporated milk, butter, peanut butter, vanilla, you know, some oats. And so I was thinking, well, you know, I could up the peanut butter and I could up the oats and I could throw some, some whey protein in there. Um, we did the chocolate, you know, just because it's already got the cocoa in there. And then they're just like little, you know, no bake cookie pucks. Um, I replaced some of the sugar with some honey, figuring that, you know, didn't have to have as much sugar in the recipe. Um, the honey seems to, you know, rather than, you know, your no bake cookies kind of being crunchy, uh, with the sugar, it, it, it kind of, they stay a little bit more gooey. So that part is, uh, a nightmare for us that don't like getting sticky hands, but yeah, it was just, um, you know, you combine the sugar and the cocoa in a saucepan, you add milk and butter, you bring it to a boil over medium high heat, let it go for a minute throw the vanilla in the uh, peanut butter and the oats and I'd mix in the protein powder, spoon it out onto a tray and let it sit in the refrigerator. It's pretty, pretty easy to do. And like I said, just having a couple of those a day for an added little protein calorie, you know, bar was pretty fun. We did. We've done that a couple of times. So yeah, those are tasty. Back in the nineties, I was in grad school and my, my advisor who was a famous protein researcher He's like, Lonnie, you know, go over to the experimental kitchen. I, I need you to make protein no-bake cookies with different kinds of protein because we were doing a study. But one with whey, one with casein, one with soy, and then some of them just had uh, the fourth group was just carbs, essentially. It didn't have the protein. And you know what really struck me is the different kinds of protein that you mix in do very different things. Like in my experience, whey protein you can mix in with a recipe and – you think, oh, I'll put in some powder. It'll dry it out. It'll thicken it up. Not so much. It, it kind of mm-hmm. stays liquidy when you mix in the whey. And that's pretty different than if you use casein or soy, you know, and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I like what you're saying about – obviously, there's some kind, there's a certain level of uh, cooking you're doing on the stovetop kind of deal just to get everything all together. But those are so convenient to grab mm-hmm. and eat. And I would have done the same thing you did. Like, how can I – bring the sugar down a little and if they're weight gain maybe you, yeah you keep the starches up like the oats but a little less on the sugar maybe and at the same time yeah it's that weird uh two-sided coin in your head like 
I have to not worry too much about sugar. I'm trying to gain weight here. But at the mm-hmm. same time, yeah, you don't want to be reckless and make it just sugar and fat. That's not that's not going to work. So No, yeah, I mean, so our feet, our food prep basically to give you an example of the day, I I basically we work out in the morning first thing. Uh, it's really the only time that we have. So we work out in the morning and then, you know, we'll have a, a shake as we're getting ready to go to work. Um, possibly, a you know, shake the, t- I, I throw a little bit of protein in my, my water when I go out to the gym, but, um, and then we'll go down to the shop and kind of have a, a small, you know, meal or snack. Gabby likes to my chia have, seeds. Her, have her chia seeds or some oatmeal, uh, with some whey protein, which if you put it in the microwave, it's kind of like a, a marshmallow that expands. And so she likes to put it in the microwave for a minute, let it expand a little bit, stir it up, do that a few times. And so it's real fluffy and increases the volume of what she's eating. Um, mm-hmm. but then we'll have, you know, if I can, if the, the day isn't too busy, I'll, I'll generally eat twice at, at work and then come home and have dinner and then a shake before bed. So those protein pucks we used to call because my my family called the no bake cookies chocolate uglies and so i just called them ugly protein <laughs> um but you know we would basically take two or three of those to work and i would just kind of have those in between the meals just as a as a nice tasty snack i don't have much of a sweet tooth i like salty and i do like you know peanut butter mm-hmm. and, i mean chocolate peanut butter it's it's delicious so um just having those just kind of thrown in throughout the day is just an added thing and again just trying to figure out how to add some calories into the gaps in the day without you know having to eat more at a meal or you know stuff in that much more volume but just have you know some little some little treats so yeah a couple of those a day you know um we would make the 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 recipe and probably have 18 or so of the the little ugly protein. Yeah, box. Sean will eat one or no, two or three a day, and I would only eat the the one because it's too good, it's too delicious. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're also half my size. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a discussion my wife and I have a lot. Like, you're half my size. How do we how do we figure out the side the portions and? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, peanut butter is great, I think, for that kind of stuff. Nuts and nut butters are great for that kind of stuff because, you know, again, nine calories in a gram of fat, and they're pretty high in fat, but it's healthy monounsaturated fat, and, you know, it's not – we're not back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, slamming Cokes and Big Macs and cakes and regular cookies and stuff. At least you're you're putting the protein building blocks in there and stuff, and you're getting a healthy, healthy calorie source. Yeah, I find it interesting when you That's start cool. thinking about this stuff, you know, like how do I how do I eat the way I'm trying to eat and add the the stuff, you know, the the calories in, you know, my mind goes to nuts and, you know, yeah, throwing an extra, you know, tablespoon of uh, MCT oil in my shake or something. Right. And yeah. you know, we have so many friends that, you know, just that aren't really all that concerned with fitness. They don't really think about these kinds of things. And in their mind, they're like, oh, you know, I'm going to try and lose weight. So I'm going to try and do some healthy things. And they immediately go to, so I'm going to eat, you know, nuts and and trail mix. And I'm going to switch from sodas to juice. And it's like funny because that's what I do to gain weight, you know? Right. You're thinking, you know, oh, these are nice, healthy options. So I'll just have trail mix and juice. And then that way it's better than what I'm doing. It's like, I don't know why I'm not losing weight. So (laughs) we could probably do a whole section on uh, misinformed diet foods, you know, p- the way the yeah. general public will think these are these are good for dieting. And I, I want to lean down. You're like, I, I don't I'm not sure that's a good choice. <laughs> OK, yeah. but but the average Joe thinks that, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they're taking a step in the right direction because they're trying to go more of a, you know, maybe a whole foods type direction. But it's just, right. it's, it's right. funny because people don't really I, I mean, I talk to my parents all the time. My mom, when she's trying to, you know, she she's, she, there's nothing to her, you know, but she feels like she's got a too much of a belly and she wants to lose weight. So she immediately goes to, now I'm just going to drink cabbage soup for the next two weeks. It's like, mom, you need calories going in. You yeah, just, extreme. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just one way or the other, you know, everybody's default is I'm just going to stop eating. And it's like, that's not, it's not going to help. Right. Yeah. Another thing right. that I did just to um, uh, help uh, weight gain, I got the Costco size mixed nuts and I kept it in my car. And whenever I was in a stoplight or something, I would grab a handful of those nuts. They're so delicious. Right on. Yep. But you have like a handful of the mixed nuts, especially with the macadamians and all of that. You're easily like munching on like 900 calories by the time you leave your house and came back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a lot of calories and 
you you always drink think that your healthy snack is a trail mix with like the um, raisins and the nuts and all of that but that has so many calories that you don't realize so i mean i had to take that out of my car it doesn't it's not there anymore but uh it still it, it served its purpose but that was one of the things that helped me put on some size like yeah. the, the nuts that a lot of people like i'm just gonna go on a hike and take a box of nuts because that's healthy but like you're putting like it's yeah like a thousand calories on that yeah. the calories do add up quick yeah. 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 What we found is, you know, I mean, for me, if I'm trying to, you know, put on size, it's just better for me to just have an open container of nuts in the car and just munch them as I'm driving. That's right. Because, you know, with Gabby, it. you know, we're doing that. And it's just like, oh, man, I don't understand why my weight is not doing what I want it to. And it's like, well, maybe it's better for you if we actually measure out portions and then you have a portion in the car because that, you know, just mm-hmm. grabbing them and going like you can end up eating way more than you think you're eating yeah. you know and you know when it's reckless weight gain it's just That's i don't right. care i need the calories then it's fine you know i just kind of sit and munch and keep going yeah you know but when you're trying to either stay at a weight stable or you know possibly stay within a weight class then it's like well now we're gonna have to actually portion things out so you have some idea of what you're eating yeah no, I get it. Yeah, Fortress and I wrote an article years ago. It was about reckless weight gain because I think for hard gainer guys in particular, but even women, sometimes you have to get dramatic. I used to drive around a lot like you guys. I would have a big bag of high calorie trail mix. Do you think that dried fruit just concentrates? It gets a lot of the water out of that and it just concentrates down the calories. Or I would have like a, you know, a box of cereal. Like I like Cracklin Oat Bran. It's it's delicious. <laughs> it's, it's like oat bran and coconut. And, and I would just put the box, like I'm trying to save some money. I would just put a box between the car seats and just constantly eat that stuff. Because at some point you're going to literally tip the scale and start gaining weight when you start going kind of re- with the reckless weight gain. But I can also see what you're saying about, you know, if you want to control the pace, you might have to portion control something like that because dried fruits and yeah, especially nuts that's gonna that can add up really really quick yeah yeah and i think you know i mean if you're trying to stay within a like with gabby i mean she's she's such a small person that you know trying to stay within a weight category if you have to you know there's definitely you got to put some thought into it and if you're younger you know you can just devour calories and it's not that yeah but oh yeah you know, i'm in my mid 40s and it's like i do want to you know put on size but at the same time i understand that i'm getting to a point where you know, losing some of that fat is going to be a longer process than it would have been, you know, 10 years ago. or 15 Right. Years yeah. Ago, so. There's going to come a time it's got to be stripped back off. Yeah. For yeah. competition. Yeah. Right. No, good stuff. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, there's, we talked about wearable tech. We talked about non-steroidal inflammatory meds. We talked about weight gain quite a bit in the, the challenges of that and it really needs addressed there's a lot of people that need to gain the right kind of weight and then um obviously the the no bake cookies good stuff well thanks you guys yay <laughs> uh, that's going to be it for this week we'll uh catch up next week with uh sean and gabby and we're going to talk about a whole new group of four topics it's just good to get this kind of perspective and stories and and that kind of stuff. I just think it's more entertaining than just sort of boring lecture stuff. So, all right. We'll see you then. Okay. See you later. Bye. The NutritionRadio.org podcast is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, check with your physician, nutritionist, or qualified exercise physiologist in order to make the progress that you need.